It describes how the supreme soul, the soul of the world, Savitri, meets that soul. And there's a wonderful description of her. But then Sri Aurobindo also says that that soul of the world puts forth a portion of herself, a small portion of herself, no bigger than the thumb of the man, to live in the hidden region of our heart, very, very deep within the heart of each one of us. There's a portion of the world soul. And this portion of the world soul is not immune. It faces pain and suffering and it experiences all that we experience. It's identified with the mind and the body and the life and takes on itself their anguish and defeat. Even though at the same time in its essence, in its reality, it is the unwounded and immortal self supporting the actor in the human scene. None of us would be here, none of us would be able to live and do all that we have to do if we were not supported from within <coughs> by this soul, which is a portion of the Supreme. So it is through this individualized soul within us that she, the Supreme Mother, sends us her glory and her powers, pushes to wisdom's heights through misery's gulfs. She gives us strength to do our daily task and sympathy that partakes of others' grief and the little strength we have to help our race. We who must fill the role of the universe acting itself out in a slight human shape and on our shoulders carry the struggling world. This is in us the Godhead, small and marred. In this human portion of divinity, she seeks the greatness of the soul in time to uplift from light to light, from power to power, till on a heavenly peak it stands, a king. In body weak, in its heart, an invincible might. It climbs, stumbling, held up by an unseen hand, a toiling spirit in a mortal shape. Here, in this chamber of flame and light, they met, they looked upon each other, knew themselves, the secret deity and its human part, the calm immortal and the struggling soul. Then with a magic transformation speed they rushed into each other and grew one. So we'll look at this part first before we move on. <clears throat> yes. 
Yes. Okay. This immortal cell, why it is a she? There may be several reasons. We can say that Savitri is an emanation of the Supreme Divine Mother. So when she encounters her true self, it's in the mother aspect that she encounters it. But also, uh, in book two of the poem, there's a canto called The World Soul. And there, King Asvapati encounters the soul of the world in the form of the, uh, the Universal Divine Mother. In Latin, the word for the soul is anima. It is a feminine word. And um, so we tend to think of the soul as the bride, the... Yes. So who will read? Rosa? Yes. <clears throat> Through this she sends us her glory and her powers. Par uh, pushes to wisdom's heights through misery's gulfs. She gi gives us strength to do our daily task and sympathy that <coughs> partakes of partakes. their of their grief and the little strength uh, we have to help our race. We who must fill the role of the universe acting acting itself out in a slight human shape and on our shoulders carry the struggling world. So through this little being, a small portion of the Supreme Soul, through this individual divine within us, she sends us her glory and her strength. She pushes us to the heights of wisdom. She goes on pushing us until we have reached there. In the previous canto, we read about the soul powers, you know, the powers of compassion and sympathy, of strength, of wisdom. So these are powers of the soul. And those powers come to us through our own individual soul. She pushes us to wisdom's heights and she pushes us through the gulfs, the deep, dark places of misery. Misery, deep unhappiness may come to any of us in our lives. But some people uh, really have to go through extremely miserable states and live under extremely miserable conditions. What keeps them going? What gives them the courage to go on living, to go on hoping, to go on working for a better life for themselves and their families. It's the soul within. Hmm? She gives us strength 
She makes us strong enough every day to do all the things that we have to do each day. And she gives us the capacity of sympathy that can share the grief of other people. We don't only think about ourselves. Our ego tends to be very much centered on ourselves or people closely connected with us. But that capacity of sympathy that can feel the suffering of other people, even people that we don't know anything about, no, except that they're suffering. That's something that comes from the soul. And she gives us whatever little strength we have to help our race, our human race. Perhaps each of us can do a little something in our lives to help humanity move forward on its journey. And that, whatever little strength we have to help the whole human race forward, comes to us through our soul. And then there are the, these amazing lines where Sri Aurobindo tells us what is the role what is the mission of humanity, of each of us? We, who must fill the role of the universe. Each of us represents the whole universe. And each of us is acting out in this slight, slight means small and weak, in this slight human shape. No? We have to act out the role of the universe. Why has the universe been created? Why does this material universe exist at all? It has a purpose and a meaning, and each of us represents a little bit of that meaning, and we have to fulfill that in our lives. No? And so each of us is carrying a responsibility, a burden on our shoulders. Each of us has to help to carry this struggling world which is having such great difficulty in reaching what it is meant to become. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Anybody would like to ask anything about this? It's a very, very important sentence. To partake, you can partake of a meal, you, you eat with other people, it means to share. This is in us to go to small and mark. It is human portion of divinity. She seeks the greatness of the soul in time, to uplift from light to light, from power to power, till on a heavenly peak it stands, a king. Yes. So this is our inner divinity. It's small, it's not the full realized divinity, and it is marred, it means in some way it is small and damaged. It's not small and damaged in its essence, but in its power of action, it is small and marred. Mm -hmm. This is the human portion of divinity. And within that individual soul of ours, she, the over-soul, the supreme soul, she seats all her greatness perhaps not all at the same time. She's all the time giving us a little more, a little more, a little more, to lift us up from our little light to a bigger light to a bigger light, and from its small amount of power, <coughs> making it stronger and stronger and stronger, <coughs> until it really becomes the ruler of the whole nature, the whole individual nature, until it becomes a king. Hmm?
Chandra, you like to read? Hmm? In body, we innate in its heart and invincible might. A climbs, stumbling, head up by an unsafe hand, a toiling spirit in the mortal shape. Yes. So it's here in the human body, and this body is not very strong, but in the heart of the soul, there's an invincible might. Might is strength, power, and invincible means that it can't be defeated, it can't be conquered. The soul is immortal, and if it suffers defeat, sometimes it has to, still it will go on, its strength continues, it will go on with its mission, its might, it's within that small portion of us, there is an invincible might, a might that can't be destroyed or conquered. Hmm? So it is climbing, it is following this human journey, climbing up to become, to reach this heavenly peak. Hmm? And as it climbs, because it's in this mortal body, it stumbles. You know what it means to stumble? No? No. So you're walking along and you trip your foot against a stone and you may fall. No? So if you are climbing a mountain, there are many rocks and obstacles and we don't just march up without any difficulty. We climb stumbling. We have difficulties and obstacles to cross. No? But all the time it is held up by the unseen hand of the Supreme Soul so that even if it falls, it can stand up again and go on with its journey. But this is a spirit which is toiling. It is working hard. It is facing difficulties. And it's here within us in this mortal shape, this human shape that we have, which is subject to death. This body that we have uh, will have to disintegrate one day. Hmm? It is mortal, subject to death. Sege. Yes. So it is the the little human portion and the the origin no? in this chamber of flame and light that Savitri has reached by passing through this rock temple of matter. No? She reaches this chamber, this secluded space of flame and light. <coughs> And there, suddenly, she met her secret soul. So when they meet, they recognize each other. They knew themselves. Savitri knows who she is and who this great being is. That's the secret deity. She has the human part. <coughs> There's the calm immortal. She's been following the struggling soul. But now they become one. There's no separation anymore between the small human portion and the origin. Yes, Sergei. One more question. This chamber of flame and light, not only for society and also for everybody? Yes, I think it's for everybody, yes. She was told that she has to find her soul in matter. 
at the beginning of this uh, book and that she has to do this on behalf of the rest of humanity to show the way so this way that she has followed going deeper and deeper into the inner being is the way that uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother recommend their disciples to follow to find this uh, cave deep within the heart And then something wonderful happens. <coughs> I'll read a bit more and then we can go around the circle again. Once more she was human upon earthly soil in the muttering night amid the rain-swept woods and the rude cottage where she sat in trance. That subtle world withdrew deeply within, behind the sun veil of the inner sight. But now the half-opened lotus bud of her heart had bloomed and stood disclosed to the earthly ray in an image shone revealed her secret soul there was no wall severing the soul and mind no mystic fence guarding from the claims of life In its deep lotus home, her being sat, as if on concentration's marble seat, calling the mighty mother of the worlds to make this earthly tenement her house. As in a flash, from a supernal light, a living image of the original power, a face, a form, came down into her heart and made of it its temple and pure abode. But when its feet had touched the quivering bloom a mighty movement rocked the inner space as if a world were shaken and found its soul out of the inconscience soulless mindless night a flaming serpent rose, released from sleep. It rose, billowing its coils, and stood erect, and climbing mightily, stormily on its way, it touched her centers with its flaming mouth as if a fiery kiss had broken their sleep they bloomed and laughed surcharged with light and bliss then at the crown it joined the eternal's space in the flower of the head in the flower of matter's base. In each divine stronghold and nature knot, it held together the mystic stream which joins the viewless summits 
with the unseen depths, the string of thoughts that make the frail defense safeguarding us against the enormous world, our lines of self-expression in its vast. You will read, please. Yes. Once more, she was human upon earthy soil. In the muttering night, amid the rain-swept woods and the rude cottage where she sat in trance, that subtle word withdrew deeply within, behind the sun veil of the inner side. Mm, thank you. So there's this amazing moment of uh, union and transformation. Mm. But then Savitri comes back to her human awareness. She's not anymore in this subtle worlds that she's been moving through uh, for the last few cantors. Mm. She's human, she's here on this earthly soil, and uh, uh, it's still a bit stormy outside. There's the muttering night, the wind and the rain, the rain-swept woods. Mm? And there she is, aware of that rude cottage, the little hut, thatched hut, where she's living with Satyavan. She has been sitting there in trance, she comes back to her normal awareness. And that subtle world that she's been moving in, it draws deeply back within. And it's as if it's veiled by a dazzling sun. She can't see that inner <clears throat> world anymore. No? Joanna. But now the half-opened lotus bud of her heart had bloomed and stood disclosed to the earthly ray. In an image shown, revealing her secret soul. Yes. So he speaks of her heart as having been like a half-opened lotus bud. No? But now it has opened. All the petals are, are open, and we know at the center of the lotus bloom, there's the there's something. No, it's where the seeds come from. No, and so it's as if there, at the heart of the lotus, there is her soul, and all this is now revealed to the earthly ray to the power of our physical sight. She can see this, at least in the form of an image. When she looks into herself, she knows where is the soul and what it looks like. Hmm? You'll read, ma'am. Thank you. So now there's no separation between the mental consciousness and the soul consciousness. <clears throat> there's no wall anymore. The mind and the soul uh, are, can communicate. And there's no kind of fence uh, when we go deep into the inner worlds. Uh, maybe we have this feeling that there's a kind of protection which is uh, keeping us safe from the claims and demands of ordinary life, 
for some time, no? But that has also gone. So it means the inner and the outer have become unified. And she's aware of her being, of her whole self sitting uh, in its deep lotus home. This word lotus, it's traditionally used for our centers, for the chakras, you know, the, the energy centers in our subtle body. So in this deep heart center, her being is sitting there as if on concentration's marble seat. I think elsewhere in the poem too, Sri Aurobindo refers to concentrations, marble seats. You know? And uh, interestingly enough, Mother has mentioned it in connection with Matrimandia. She said around in the gardens there should be marble seats for people to sit on for concentrating. I suppose the connection between concentration and marble is that marble is a very, very pure form of matter. It's very dense and hard and strong, but also uh, can be a pure white color, or it may have some beautiful pink color. No? So, uh, and perhaps when we go into a very deep state of concentration, it's as if the whole body is made of marble, of rock. It doesn't move. It's a, a very strong, quiet base. So there she is calling to that higher being, the mighty mother of the worlds, to come and make this earthly tenement, the body, her house. A tenement, in fact, is a... I mean, we usually use the word for a block of flats often rather small, poor quality flats. We won't use the, the word for a beautiful condominium. No? Um, it's a place where people rent a room or a small flat for a short time. So Shobindo compares the body to a tenement, not very desirable residence where the soul remains for some time. No? <clears throat> But now she's calling her higher self, her origin, to come and make this body her house, to come and live in the human body. And uh, there's a response from ab above. Something happens. Alice, would you read? As in a flash from a supernal light, a living image of the original power, a face, a form came down into her heart and made of it its temple and pure abode. Yes, so an image of the original power of the Supreme Mother, a face, a form, a body came down into that lotus center of her heart and made that its temple and pure abode. Your abode is the place where you live. So she has answered that um, aspiration. She has come to live in the human body. Mm. But that also has a remarkable effect, Mahalingam. Well. When you speak that that superior blue, the mighty moment of the inner space, as if the world were shaken and formed its soul. Out of the unconscious, soulless, mindless night, the flaming serpent rose, released from sleep. Yes. <clears throat> so when the feet of the Divine Mother touch this lotus center of Savitri's, heart, her human heart, there's something like an earthquake when, it's, when the feet of the divine have touched that 
quivering bloom, uh, that delicate blossom which is the open heart. Suddenly the whole inner space, it says if there's an earthquake, an earthquake of a whole planet, as if a world were shaken and has found its soul. And in response to that, out of the inconscious, soulless, mindless night, out of all the unconsciousness of matter and that is below the living body, no? a flaming serpent rose, it comes up, it's released from sleep, it has been sleeping there. So, of course, in the old literature, we read about this serpent, this serpent of energy, which is lying, sleeping, curled up at the base of the spine. Hmm? Kundalini. The Kundalini, yes. And uh, we will see, it, it, it rises up up the, not exactly the spinal column, but the subtle um, column which corresponds to the spinal column. Right? So that's described in the next sentence. When it rises, it opens all the chakras. Yeah, that's what we're going to um, read about. Ati will read that. Yeah? Rosh, billowing its form, and stood erect. And climbing mightily, stormily on his way, it touched, it touched her centers with its flaming mouth. And if a fiery kiss had broken their sleep, their bloom and love surcharged with light and bliss. Yes, so that's just what Dana Lakshmi says in the traditional literature. It's described like that, the way this. Uh, current of energy, this flaming serpent rises up and it touches each of the chakras in turn and as it does so they wake up. Hmm? They, they also bloom, the, 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 the centers open, they blossom and he says they laugh, they are surcharged, overcharged with light and bliss. It's difficult for them to bear that intensity of that energy. No? It's low, it's in connection with the soul, no? Below. Yeah, below. No, billowing is the movement of waves, actually. Waves on the ocean, billowing. So uh, this is not just going straight up like that, it's going up like this. Uh, it was all coiled up and now it is straightening out and these coils, they form this kind of wave shape and they are waves of energy. You read, please. Then at the crown, we joined the eternal space. In the flower of the head, in the flower of matter's base, in each divine stronghold and nature not, it held together the mystic stream with joints, the viewless summits with the unseen depths, the string of force that make the frail defense, safeguarding us against the enormous world, our lines of self-expression in its thoughts. Yes. So here, at the crown of the head, the serpent comes up and it joins, he says, the eternal space. So each of these chakras and centers in our body, they represent a plane of existence. This one at the base of the spine, it represents the inconscient, the pure a basic matter hmm? and then there are other different levels but each through each of them we can reach a, a plane or a level of existence 
So when it has touched them all and opened them all up, it comes here to the top of the head and there it joins the transcendent realm beyond the manifestation, the eternal space. Later on, he's going to describe the action in each of the centers. But first, he says, in the flower of the head. So at the crown, there is one, but deep inside the head, there is also one, the flower of the head. And then there's the flower at the base of the spi spine, the flower of matter's base. All these centers, these lotuses, are, uh, he says, strongholds. And then he uses the word forts, a string of forts. <coughs> a fort is a, a strong building where soldiers may live to defend <coughs> a border, for example, to defend a particular area. So he says these centers <coughs> are like a string of connected forts, strongholds. Hmm? Each of them is a divine stronghold. Each of them is the, the, <coughs> the strong home of a divine energy and power. And each of them is a nature knot, a, a place where uh, different uh, powers of nature come together in a strong knot. No? So this uh, stream of energy is held together, this mystic stream which joins the viewless summits, the very high levels of consciousness that we can't see, and with the, the, the very deepest levels, the unseen depths, which we do not see. Hmm? This string of thoughts and the connection between them forms the frail defense safeguarding us against the enormous world. In order for us to be individualized beings, we need this uh, line of protection formed by the closed chakras. They keep out the universal forces. They only allow in so much as we can use for our growth and life and development. And that's why it's very, very dangerous uh, by whatever means to, on purpose or accidentally, open up the chakras before we're ready for that. No? Because then we can just get swept away by the universal forces, have no more individualized center. Hmm? The defense is very inspired out of cleaning up. The, the string of forts in themselves are relatively frail. They are here in our body and it's a, a defense, but it is possible for the universal forces to sweep in and destroy them. Mm -hmm. this, yes, it is a stronghold and he's describing it as a stronghold and we can experience how strong they are when we try to open them up. We can feel the, the strength of each of those nature knots and those strongholds. But um, still, compared with the force of the whole universe, that's a frail defense, mm -hmm. our individual uh, defense <coughs> against the vastness of the universal energy. But at the same time, these forts are our lines of self-expression in its vast. These are the ways in which we relate to and express our soul in the universal movement. Mm. 
I think we will stop there for today. We can read these lines together. We can go back to line 180. <clears throat> Through this she sends us her glory and her powers pushes to wisdom's heights through misery's gulfs. She gives us strength to do our daily task and sympathy that partakes of others' grief and the little strength we have to help our race. We who must fill the role of the universe, acting itself out in a slight human shape, and on our shoulders carry the struggling world. This is in us, the Godhead, small and marred. In this human portion of divinity, she seats the greatness of the soul in time to uplift from light to light, from power to power, till on a heavenly peak it stands, a king. In body weak, in its heart an invincible might, it climbs stumbling, held up by an unseen hand. A toiling spirit in a mortal shape. Here in this chamber of flame and light they met. They looked upon each other, knew themselves, the secret deity and its human part, the calm immortal and the struggling soul. Then with a magic transformation speed, they rushed into each other and grew one. Once more she was human upon earthly soil, in the muttering night, amid the rain-swept woods, and the rude cottage where she sat in trance. That subtle world withdrew deeply within, behind the sun-veil of the inner sight. But now the half-opened lotus bud of her heart had bloomed and stood disclosed to the earthly ray. In an image shone revealed her secret soul. There was no wall severing the soul and mind, no mystic fence guarding from the claims of life. In its deep lotus home her being sat as if on concentration's marble seat, calling the mighty mother of the worlds 
to make this earthly tenement her house. As in a flash from a supernal light, a living image of the original power, a face, a form, came down into her heart and made of it its temple and pure abode. But when its feet had touched the quivering bloom, a mighty movement rocked the inner space as if a world were shaken and found its soul. Out of the inconscious, soulless, mindless night, a flaming serpent rose, released from sleep. It rose, billowing its coils, and stood erect, and climbing mightily, stormily on its way, it touched her centers with its flaming mouth. As if a fiery kiss had broken their sleep, they bloomed and laughed, surcharged with light and bliss. Then at the crown it joined the eternal space. In the flower of the head, in the flower of matter's base, in each divine stronghold and nature knot, it held together the mystic stream which joins the viewless summits with the unseen depths, the string of forts that make the frail defence safeguarding us against the enormous world, our lines of self-expression in its vast.